Church, we're going to dive into this. There's no need for you to stand tonight because I'm going to eat up uh, the, every bit of uh, time I have to get through this this evening. We have a lot of information to bring to you. But obviously, uh, we've invited you to come out tonight on this Wednesday night uh, because of all that's going on in the world around us. Constant dynamics changing, uh, which require vigilance and for us to be very diligent about what we're seeing and what we're hearing. This is a time, church family, listen up, that you need to be careful as to what you're listening to and who you're listening to by news sources, by clips, or by even uh, postings, by uh, Bible people. Just have your Bible near at hand, know it, read it, uh, and be safe with that, because this is a tremendous time. And yet, that should encourage us, because listen up, uh, Matthew chapter 24. Now, as you turn there, as you look to that, Matthew chapter 24 is our launch point tonight, in this update, and um, be advised that in Matthew 24, it's amazing. Imagine right now before you, when it, before I read it, a, a palette, uh, an artist in the palette, and the artist is going to. Have you, have you guys ever watched that guy, Bob Ross? Yes. You know that guy is. He's more popular today. My grandkids watch him, <laughs> and he's doing paintings from like the 70s or 80s. He has his own channel. And the guy's dead. I think he's dead. Isn't he dead? Uh, okay. So Bob Ross has got a white blank palette. And, and he starts doing stuff with his brush. And it looks like he doesn't know what he's doing. You have to admit, it doesn't look... It, what is he doing? And he's got this orange. Everything's orange. And then he's got a black dot over here. And... By the end of the program, he's got this incredibly beautiful sunset mountain scene with a cabin. You can almost hear the little birds chirping. And um, it's, just, it's just amazing. Plus, if you have insomnia, I met Bob Ross during my insomnia years because uh, they run him all night long and he's so calming and I thought, this guy's going to do it for me. And it, it didn't happen. I was like fascinated by what he was doing. But um, remember, as we read this, the palette that Jesus is painting covers a vast period of time and then rapidly covers, if you keep reading in Matthew 24, it covers then a very quick period of time, specifically seven years and then three and a half years and then conclusion. But leading up to that, Matthew chapter 24, verse 1, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Why would they do that? You say, Jack, isn't that kind of weird? The disciples want to show him the temple? Doesn't he know all about the temple? Yes, he knows all about the temple, but believe it or not, Jesus and the disciples rarely ever spent time in Jerusalem. They stayed, Jesus stayed mostly in the north. He would only come to Jerusalem three times a year during the three required feasts of a Jewish male to go to uh, and go to Jerusalem. So they wanted to visit the temple. They wanted to talk about it with Jesus. Everything's normal to that. Verse 2, and Jesus said to them, I mean, he's just going to really drop a bomb on them. Uh, they're all excited about how beautiful the temple was or is at the moment. And Jesus says, do you not see all of these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Can you see? <laughs> they're just like, look at the temple. And then he says, it's all going to fall apart. Now, you got to remember where they're at. Jesus is, to them, a great prophet. He has done miracles. He's told them that he's the son of God. Have they come to the grip of that? The Bible says they haven't. They will not come to the understanding of that fully until after the resurrection, the Bible says. So then he says to them, all of this is going to be torn down. Listen, if you're Jewish... And a prophet says, it's all coming down. That's to say this. It would be equivalent to me saying, no, no, not me. It'd be equivalent to like um, a high-ranking political official in America today saying, you see the Capitol? You see the White House? You see the Pentagon? It's all going to come tumbling down. People would say, are you crazy? 
Put yourself in their sandals back then. This was shocking. Because this is the building that God built. This is his house. Nothing could happen to this. Because this is our identity. And Jesus is telling them basically, well, your identity is about ready to have a shift. Because we're going to be moving away from the buildings and away from the typology and away from the structures because God, after the resurrection, is going to wind up moving inside of every believer. You're going to become the temple. And so it's tremendous. But they don't know this at that time. And so verse 3 says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, which means he went across the Kidron Valley and then sat on the Mount of Olives with the disciples who came to him privately and they asked him a a three-part question if you can uh, catch it with me number one tell us when would these things be they had to be so shocked number two and what would be the sign of your coming and number three and the end of the world or the end of the age same difference and Jesus answered and said to them take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying I am Messiah In other words, false religions, promising, utopia, heaven, nirvana, some sort of paradise. There's going to be false messiahs. That's going to increase globally. Now that's always been, but Jesus is saying it's going to escalate. It's going to get more so. You know, you and I are somewhat protected at this moment from this reality because We live in one of the last, as weak as it is, we live in one of the last remaining bastions of a Judeo-Christian influenced culture. That's soon to break. That's soon to vanish. When that happens, you're going to see a plethora of street prophets, miracle workers, shamans. They're coming if they're not already here that will be preaching a different way to get to heaven. And uh, we know from Jesus and other teachings, as we know from Paul and Peter as well, and John, that there's going to be not only strange doctrines about false messiahs, but they're also going to be able to do tremendously powerful miracles that are powered by Satan. Think of that. A great time of deception is coming. And they will, notice the term is, and will deceive many. I find it interesting, the English word many, but the Greek word here is, and they will deceive not a few. It means a great amount of people. It means the bulk, not just some. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, we know what that's like. Jesus is saying, it's going to increase. See? That you are not troubled for all these things. Stop right there, church. Everything I've told you up until this moment, everybody, Jesus is saying to them, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. That little period at the end of yet is a very important thing. Because that yet means all of these things are going to come. You can expect them to come. It's going to be normal that they come. But there's going to reach a point where we in this room who have studied Bible prophecy, know of that term quickening. Now, if you are a woman who has given birth, or if you're a a pediatrician, or an OBGYN, or a a delivery nurse, um, you know what that word means, quicken or quickening. The quickening is where the the body of the the woman, she's pregnant, and uh, everything begins now to communicate chemically, biologically, The body says, uh, we got everything in alignment. Now's the time to start the quickening. And um, the body starts to cause certain things to happen. For one thing, obviously, one of the things is the mother's or the mom-to-be, what happens? Her water breaks. But there's a lot of things going on before that, that the body initiates the sequence of... (laughs) The sequence, I was going to say, it sounds like a rocket ship launch, but the sequence of the launch. And, and that launch being the baby coming out. And the Bible uses the exact same, same term. There's going to be a time in the world where things are going to go on as I have said, as Jesus announces that he spoke 
I told you about these things. But there's going to come a time after the yet that will really get the quickening happening. You're going to go from eight months of pregnancy to a really quick time that, uh, of any moment now where that baby can come. And the very term used, quickening, is that of pregnant. The earth will be populated with very, very many signs of prophecy, pregnancy of events. A lot of things are going to be happening. And what's really amazing is you and I now, in the, just in these last several months, if not the last few years, where things have been happening, and if you're not rooted in the Bible, your head's been spinning with confusion and fear and whatever. Listen to what Jesus has to say. Indicator. For nation will rise against nation. The word is ethnos. Ethnos will rise up against, there will be ethnic wars. The blacks against the whites, whites against the blacks, the reds against the yellows, yellows, red, yellow, white. Mix it up. That's what he's saying. Ethnicities will begin to become segregated and then they'll war against other colors. When this says nations, it doesn't mean U.S. versus Russia. That's coming in a moment. Ethnic groups will begin to break away and they'll cling together and they'll go after other ethnicities. Is that happening in the world? But this is just the beginning. But it is happening. Look, if you're an atheist here tonight, you have to agree. Everything that you've just heard so far and seen here in Scripture, it's like, yeah, wow, I didn't know that. I sure see that going on. Absolutely. Jesus is going to tell us soon there's going to be more of it. He also says that there's going to be... Um, well, he says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For the ethnos will rise against the ethnos and kingdom. This is politics. Political powers will war or rage against political powers. There will be famines. That's interesting because the word there will be famines is connected to the political battles. I find that interesting. It's not going to be a famine because God doesn't send rain on the earth. God's faithful. In fact, look what's happening right now, for real. If you're watching the news basically constantly, right now in Gaza, all the Palestinians were down at the Rafah gate where all of the billion dollars of food and water are at, medicines. They've gone down there to get help. So you've been watching the news where at gunpoint in some... Uh, areas, Hamas is driving the people away from the uh, relief goods back into central Gaza, and they're confiscating the goods. They're just pimping the people. Many famines that take place in the world around us today are political famines. Now look, if you want to go and pitch your tent in the Death, in death Valley and you're going to try to grow some corn, that's on you, knucklehead. You should not have done, you shouldn't have picked that piece of land. You're going to have a famine. Okay? But the earth provides, but Jesus hinted to us here, there's going to be people that are starving, and it's going to be for political reasons. And that has come and gone throughout the centuries, but it's going to increase. Everything he's saying here is going to increase. And he goes on to say that there's going to be pestilence. That's the word term means incurable diseases, sicknesses. And earthquakes in various places, like today, Japan 6.6. .6, but for Japan, 6.6 .6 is like, that's like nothing to them. But earthquakes are on the increase, they tell us. But that's not the point. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you. Now you think about this for a moment. How long ago was this written? 2,000 years ago. They will deliver you. He, he tells them about prophetic events that are coming. And then he says and implies that as the days go long, all of these guys would have, would have, would have been gone, dead by now. 
enter you and I, were they persecuted? Yes. But it's interesting that Jesus says right here, and you will be delivered up or uh, placed in the realm of persecution, tribulation, and kill you. That's been true for all ages of the believer for 2,000 years. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That's an indicator. That's very powerful. Jesus is talking to 12 guys, and then he's going out. And are you remember the, remember the Bob Ross paint job? Now he's going with a broad brush, and he's getting ready to put more structure to the painting. And he's saying, as time goes down, things will become more clear. And these are the things to look at specifically. People get caught up in thinking, he told that to them then. It can't mean what it means now. That can't be true. It's exactly what it means. He told them then about what was going to happen to them and for us all the way out to the end. That is, is when he comes. It's absolutely amazing. Tremendous painting. And so he says here, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And we're going to end right there as we get into this study about what's going on in current events around us. I'm going to read very quickly, and then i got a stack of news that we'll do our best to... Are you guys okay? That we're going to do our best to, uh, to go on. So guys, on the screen. I've been asking everybody for months to read this, and I just figured, nope, forget it. I'm not going to ask anymore. We're just going to read it. <laughs> Before we start reading Ezekiel 38... Let me do a 30,000 foot flyover of Ezekiel 36. You're interested in in Ezekiel 36 and 37. Uh, Why? Because those prophecies have already come to pass. Ezekiel 36, the prophecies put out that Israel is dispersed throughout all the nations of the world. And God says to Ezekiel, do you see this? Valley of dry bones? Ezekiel says yes. He says, watch what happens. And Ezekiel sees this valley of bones in his vision start to stand up. Can you imagine? Think about this. I mean, if, if, if somebody like Jerry Bruckheimer or, 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 or Spielberg or somebody can do technology like this in a movie, special effects, can you imagine God's special effects in a vision? Ezekiel's watching this and he sees arms come together and shoulders and then ribs on spines, skulls coming and put into place. And Ezekiel says, I saw a valley of skeletons standing. And then uh, sinew, muscle began to form. And he's watching this and he's describing it in in chapters 36 and 7. He's watching this come together, and he's asking, what's going on? And God says, it's the nation of Israel going to come back to life again. But they're not alive yet. They're just standing there. And then he says, I'm going to put skin on them. And he sees skin form on this innumerable valley of these dead but standing Jews. And then God says, I'm going to breathe into them the breath of life and they're going to live again. And then chapter 37, he says, I'm going to now bring them into their own land and they're going to gather together and they're going to become a nation again in the latter times. God told that to Ezekiel nearly 3,000 years ago. And lo and behold, Israel has come together as a nation a second time. And they are tonight. So why is chapter 38 so important? You'll see why. It starts out by saying, Now the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel is speaking, saying, Son of man, that was his title that God gave him. Only Jesus Christ is called Son of man. Ezekiel and Jesus. Set your face against Gog. Remember, church, Gog is a person. He's a commander. He's a leader. He's a general. Of the land of Magog. That's the land of the north of the Scythian mountains, north of the Caspians. We know it as Russia today. The prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, all of those re- regions are of Russia in our calendar or calendar, 
in our maps today. And prophesy against him. Who? Who's him? Gog, the commander. And thus uh, says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Watch, everybody. This is so important. Do I have all of your attention? Keep your eye on this. And why is this important? Before I read verse 4, we don't know right now what's happening with Israel in the sense of is Ezekiel battle uh, forming or is what's going on right now just another one of those things that happen from time to time in the Middle East? What do we know? Everybody around the world is talking about the Ezekiel 38 battle. We've got to be careful about this. It's true, we've never been this close to the Ezekiel 38 battle, but we've got a snag right now. And it's in verse 4. It says in verse 4, I, that is God, will turn you around, that is Gog, and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out. What does that mean? Notice that Gog is facing away from Israel. He's not looking at Israel. He's, 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 his back is to Israel. But something's going on in Israel, or about to go on, where God says, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw, and I'm going to turn you around. That speaks of an unwillingness to get involved. You say, well, Jack, right now, Russia's got troops just north of uh, Lebanon, and north of Israel and Syria. Yes, that's true. However, we don't know if this is going to be an escalation to this magnitude. I know I might be bumming somebody out because you're thinking Ezekiel is going to happen tomorrow. Listen, we could be en route to the formation of Ezekiel tonight, but we can't say that for sure. We don't want to be sensationalist. We want to be accurately, biblically. We know this, that the leader... He could have troops that are there now, and they are. Russian troops are just north of Israel on the other side of the border. But the leader, Gog, he doesn't want to get involved. He doesn't want to get involved. God will pull him into it. Are you tracking? Watch how this happens. So I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all of your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, that's Iran. Isn't it interesting that the Bible put Iran first? Iran is probably the predominant leader right now, not Gog. Interesting, right? Persia is the leader right now in this war. Putin's, you know, Putin's got his hands busy with Ukraine. That's a whole other story, not for long. I mean, Ukraine is being, uh, talk about genocide. Ukraine is being decimated right now with uh, a horrible weapon. You know, it's funny. Everybody's crying about Israel defending itself. Who's, anybody crying about Russia exterminating people, babies, horses, cats, grandpas, people, soldiers, everybody? Russia is just literally leveling cities and killing everybody. Russia doesn't, Russia's not, Russia's never been attracted to smart bombs. Did you know that? I'm not joking. Russia is not big on smart bombs. Russia loves the fact that their bombs are radical, so they're not exactly sure where they land. That is a, that is a uh, political ploy, by the way. It's brilliant. Once you have a tactical weapon that is strategically pinpoint technology, if, if, if it strays off anywhere, now you're in big trouble. Russia just says, hey, it's war. We just throw the kitchen sink and whatever we can find. If you're in the way, it's your problem. That's, that's Russian warfare mind. Think of this. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. Well, there's three Muslim nations right there. Are with them. All of them. With shield and helmet. Watch this. We'll put it together. Gomer and all its troops. The house of Togomar from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. Togomar and uh, Gomer, those are regions that are occupied by Islamic nations today. And Togomar is the realm that engulfs Turkey at this very moment. 
Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all of your companies that are gathered about you. And be a guard. Circle the word guard. If you have your Bible open, you ought to circle the word guard. Remarkable. I'm going to tell you what it means, but don't believe me. Because you need to go read it for yourself. You're going to say, you're making it up. I'm not. Whoever Gog is, he's the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And he's going to be drawn down into this coalition of Muslim nations as of today. Muslim nations. And what's amazing about this is, is that Gog is going to be a guard for them. The Hebrew word for guard is he will become a military supplier. The word means to supply or to bear arms on behalf of, to give weapons to. It is so accurate that you're going to be tempted tonight not to believe what I'm telling you in a nearly 3,000-year-old prophecy. Whoever Gog is, he's going to be one who supplies weaponry to the nations that are listed here. You research it and see the word guard. After many days, this is, it gets fun now, everybody. After many days, you will be visited. The, the word after many days is exactly no damage whatsoever, total correlation with the term last days. Do I have your attention, people? This is, we're just in, we're, right now, we're just having a coffee table talk about world events. If somebody says, oh, this happened, this happened back in Ezekiel's day, then we have a big problem here. Because God is announcing it's going to happen at the time of the end. This is, what you're reading has never happened before. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Palestine? Israel. That word Israel has been there for nearly 3,000 years. 2,000 655 years. Which had long been desolate. The land had long been desolate. Almost 2,000 years the land had been desolate. Israel had been dispersed throughout all the nations of the world. Interesting. They, who? Whoever Israel is, they were brought out of the nations... And now all of them dwell safely. Circle the word safety, safely. That word safely, it's a misleading word in our English. What, is, what does safely mean to you? Safe? Secure? Good word. Good word. Safely, this word in Hebrew means an assumed safety. It's a safety that is wrapped with political bows. You're safe now. Oh, good. They're very happy about being safe now. It's an, it's an assumed safety. Remember when Chamberlain reported back to the parliament in England in World War II and said, whew, it's all good. Wait, did I say Chamberlain? Neville, Neville, Neville. Chamberlain, right? P Peace in our time. Where did he get that from? Hitler told him, we don't want anything to do with England. You're good. Go have some tea. <laughs> he flew back home and announced, peace in our time. All the while, Hitler was drawing up war plans to invade England. That's how warfare works. Except us. We tell people three months in advance, we're going to bomb you at 205 in the afternoon at this location, we're gonna blow up a fire hydrant, and so all of you make sure you're, you go somewhere else. That's what, we honestly do that. It's, it's what happens when politicians are in the military and they shouldn't be. Um, I'll probably get a knock on the door tonight when I'm sleeping after that. <laughs> you will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God. On that day, it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind. And you will make an evil plan. Isn't it amazing? We're reading future thoughts. Isn't it kind of creepy? Kind of cool though, right? We know stuff that this guy doesn't even know that's coming yet. 
He should have tuned in tonight. <laughs> you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Stop right there. That's not true right now. Israel is not safe. Israel has a, a giant wall all around it, so it's a terrorist wall. And um, here's what's interesting about where we're at right now. This is my personal opinion. Warning, personal opinion. Are we en route to Ezekiel's battle? Well, certainly we're en route. Is this it? I don't know. I don't think so yet. Why? I think personally, my speculation, warning, that whatever's going on right now, Israel's going to be victorious. By whatever means, I don't know. They're going to come out of this feeling good about it. They're going to let down their guard and feel very safe. Does that make sense? That's what I'm expecting right now. By the way, oh, I, got a, I got an email written by a rabbi. I'm, not, I, I, I'm still processing it because I don't even know if it's true, if it's real. I have to find out. But regarding all this stuff, what's happened the other night with, when Iran inv invaded Israel. Did you know nobody was killed? A young girl was wounded. Did you know barely anything was damaged? And it was a massive attack. It turns out now, it wasn't 300 cruise missiles, drones, and ballistic missiles. It was 400. Did you hear, you can read all about it later, that some of them were destroyed by Israel's Iron Dome. Some of them were destroyed by British technology and U.S. technology. Some of it was destroyed by Saudi Arabia. They had something to do with it. But did you know that over 50, some are saying 60% of the munitions that were launched, be it rocket, missile, whatever, blew up on the launch pad in Iran. Yes. <laughs> Just blew up. <laughs> it's like, wow. But this rabbi wrote and, and said, there is no way, there is no way, there's no way, there's no way. And he's apologizing for what he's, I, I, he says, this had to be a miracle. And now I'm looking for God to do more miracles. I, and he's apologizing be, because he's being, that's too radical. You need, to tone, you need to tone it down. And he's, he's saying, I think God was really the one that protected us. And that's, that's radical right now for a rabbi to say in Israel right now. But I, I, again, I don't know if that's true. I'm, I'm trying to have that vetted out to see if it's for real. But somehow Israel is going to have to feel safe before verse 11 can happen. Does that make sense? And so this is what Gog and his gang, verse 12, is saying, or this is what's being critiqued about them, to take a plunder and to take loot or wealth. The Bible, Bible says uh, booty, and everybody laughs when I read booty, <laughs> but if you've ever watched a good pirate show, <laughs> what you get from your enemy is booty, <laughs> chest and gold and stuff. In Israel's case, more technology uh, than anything, right? To stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, Israel. And against the people gathered from the nations, Israel. Who have acquired livestock, Israel. And goods, yep. Who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba, Dedan, Sheba, Dedan, Sheba, Dedan, Read Genesis chapter 10 and 11. Sheba and Dedan is the region today of a post-World War II 
Saudi Arabia. The Saudi family actually is the family that was given the jurisdiction of what was always called and known as Sheba and Dedan, that region of the world. You know as Saudi Arabia. The merchants of Tarshish, scholars disagree on this, but who cares? Listen to the disagreement. Some say it's Spain. Some say it's England. Some say it's France. I say, who cares? <laughs> it's Europe. Remember Jonah got in the ship to head to Tarshish? That's just on the other end of the Mediterranean. As far as you can go before you get into the Atlantic. Tarshish. And some people say this is where America is hidden in here somewhere. I don't know, it's a stretch, but whatever. And all the young lions will say, they, they place us in there. The nations that have come out of the West, it's highly possible. The nations that have come out of the West, if you think about it, Argentina, the United States, Canada, right? South American nations, they came from Spain, Portugal, right? Think about it. My family's original roots from the Azor Islands off of Portugal down to Sao Paulo, Brazil, then over to Hawaii. The Bible's given us a breadcrumb trail to follow. Have you come, this is what they're going to say, have you come, Gog, they're talking to, to take a plunder? In other words, they file a UN resolution of condemnation. That's all they do. We're filing the letter saying you shouldn't have done this. What are you going to do about it? We're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> We're just little squeaky nations. Terrified of you. And have you gathered your army to take the loot, the goods, and to carry away silver and gold and to take away livestock goods to the great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north. Circle those two words, far north. The word means uttermost parts of the north. As far north, by the way, this is kind of fun, wake up call. The pin, the pin drop on Google, when God uses Google, the pin drop of the epicenter of the world, and when God says north, south, east, or west in the Bible, it's always north, east, south, or west from Jerusalem. Did you know that? It's awesome. You know how, because we're Americans, when you look at a map that's laid out, right, in a big rectangle like this, where's America? It's in the middle. But if you get a map from, if you get a map from China, China's in the middle. But if you get a map from God, Jerusalem's in the middle. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And when it says north, it means north from Jerusalem. When it says south, south from Jerusalem. Isn't that fantastic? The Bible is written geographically with Jerusalem in the middle. And when this word says far north, the, word, the Hebrew word means the furthest part north that you can go. Guess what? You can only go so far north, and then you start going south. You can go west for forever, and you can go east forever, but you can only go north and south until you go north or south. When you snap a line, any of you navigators in here right now, sailors, pilots, there's two norths, is there not? Anybody know? There's two norths, everybody. There's true north and there's magnetic north. True north is true north. Magnetic north is always moving. And when you fly or when you navigate, you better know that. There's a big difference, and you got to calculate that. It doesn't matter. When you take a th thread on your globe and put it on Jerusalem and take thread to true north, look where it goes through. As far as you can go north. And then take another piece of thread and go magnetic north and see where it goes. Guess where they both land? Russia. And so, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army, you will come against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. This is awesome. It's never happened yet. That I will bring you against my land. 
So that the nation, here's, here's what's going to happen in the Ezekiel battle. I'm setting this up. God says, I'm putting everybody in line. And oh, by the way, he tells us why he's doing it. So that the nations may know me when I am hallowed, honored, in you, O Gog, before their eyes. In other words, I'm going to make an example out of you that the world will never forget. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I've spoken in former days but, uh, by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? And it will come to pass, notice the latter day talk, end time talk, at that same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. This is God speaking. For in my jealousy and in, in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, probably referring to the Mediterranean, the birds of the heavens in the sky, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Whatever's going to happen eventually, broad painting, Bob Ross... Getting close now. I can make things out now. That black blob at the start is now a cabin in the woods. This is all moving toward the time of the end before Christ comes in the second coming to establish his kingdom. But remember this. All of this battle, he's, he's describing things. He'll speak about the past. He'll speak about what's happening and what's going to the future. It's amazing. The mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. That's the, I believe that's the uh, reference that you might be reading about in the book of Revelation, or it could be a second earthquake. I will call for a sword against Gog and throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God, every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and on his troops and on many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known. This has never happened before. I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. That's it. That is going to be, you see the broad brush all the way out. This is why, by the way, many scholars place the Ezekiel battle in the opening days of the tribulation period. Because that talk begins to pop up in other portions of scripture that speak about the tribulation period. So here's some news. Number one, guys, I'm going to call out these numbers for these, these uh, uh, slides. Number one, Europe is already planning for what happens in, if Ukraine loses. It's ugly. It's very ugly. Uh, Russia... It's taking advantage right now while all the world is looking at uh, Israel and talking about Israel in the Middle East and what's happening there. Russia has just turned things up so much since October 7th. The brutality you're not watching and you're not seeing because it's not being covered. And so Europe is very, very concerned. Did you guys know that Europe, even though uh, some of the countries have some great militaries, did you know that they became, now they've woken up too soon, overly dependent on the U.S., to be the police officer of the world, and now we are not, nor can we be. I wish America would not, you know, get involved in things. Don't, okay, your prayer's been answered, because we ain't got the strength or the wherewithal. Okay, just know that. Europe is very concerned tonight. Why? Slide 15. Iranian president, tiniest invasion by Israel will be met with massive response. That's what's happening tonight on the news. When's it going to happen? The clock is ticking. Could it be tonight? Could it be now? Is it going to be daytime or night? Israel usually, when it comes to these things, usually strikes at night, but that's, or in the early hours of the morning. But that's neither here nor there. The thing is this. Everybody in the world is anticipating, because here's what happened. You know, was it last Saturday? When was that? It was Iran, a nation, this is different. It's not Hamas and Hezbollah, terrorist groups attacking Israel. This was a sovereign nation attacking a sovereign nation. 
That is called a declaration of war. The moment you press a button and your ballistics lands on another country, you've declared war on them. No one's saying this right now, but if you're an attorney, the current situation is known as a state of war. Who started it? Iran. They legally did. And then, so watch, Iran uh, launches this, this attack. It's a total flop. So then the world tells Israel, well, because it was a flop, you can't retaliate back. No, you... So Joe picks up the phone and calls Bibi Netanyahu and says, nobody died, so you can't respond. We will not have your back. Have you been following this rhetoric? My head is spinning. On Monday, we are your staunchest allies. On Tuesday, you're on your own. Wednesday, nothing's going to, we're not going to let nothing happen without us helping you. Thursday, who are you? Have you seen how, how psychopathic, bipolar, uh, what's the word? It's been the craziest thing. And no one's taking us seriously anymore. Yeah, why should they? We're a laughing stock. That's, but look, it's part of God's plan. We deserve to be a laughing stock. Iran threatens to attack Israel with weapons it has not used before, it says, as it gets military support from Russia. So number one, um, looming right now is Iran saying, so we just bombed you, and it was a total flop. We look horrible, but you can't attack us because we didn't do any, really didn't do anything to you. So you can't attack us. Israel says, no, no, we're coming. You know, they said they're coming. They actually said, we will come, we're coming, and we will pick the day and the hour and the second, and we will do it when we decide. And this is, so when, that, when Israel said that, then they came back with slide number two, which is what you're looking at now, sorry guys, slide two. They came back with slide number two, is we're, if you do that, then we're going to use a weapon we've never used before. So I may upset a whole lot of you right now, but does anybody remember 50 billion 50 billion dollars in cash being loaded on C-17, U.S. Air Force C-17 Globemasters. A massive plane. Can you imagine? This is a fact. Pallets of cash was flown to Tehran and given to the Ayatollahs. Cash. Your cash. Listen. Listen. Where was, where was the congressional investigation? Congress didn't even know about it. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. We're out, listen, this country's done. Right now, we're trying to lock up a former president while the current president and his son and then the whole entourage of the whole group that Obama sends billions of cash so Iran can build a nuclear weapons program? And nobody calls for a hearing, nobody calls for impeachment, nobody calls for an investigation. It makes you think all it makes you think all of the politicians are in on it. Republican and Democrat the same. Think about it. What in the world's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. God's moving countries. He knew all this. He knows what's gonna happen tomorrow. But that's pretty amazing. The Obama administration didn't send mega billions to Chile for their energy program. Besides, don't you think we could have used that in California? No, wait. No, wait. I can hear Gavin Newsom saying, I could have used it in California. (laughs) But we still would have had power outages anyway. And I'm sure I'll get a knock on the door tonight about that. Number 14. Number 14. Hamas leader Hananiah set 
to meet Turkish President Erdogan. Excuse me, a head of state. Look, uh, Turkey's one of, the most, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Amazing people. The Turkish people are amazing people. Erdogan, the, thing, the scary thing about Erdogan is he believes Allah has called him to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. He believes this. Who's he meeting with? A terrorist organization. Wow, that's slide 14. Slide number four, just more of it. Erdogan, Netanyahu to blame for Iranian attack on Israel. <laughs> The only way you can get that uh, past people is if they don't have access to the internet. How can he say that? He's highly educated. Wow. Number seven, guys. Russia. To back Iran's right to retaliate against Israel at UN, foreign minister says. What country is going to support Iran? Yeah, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Who's going to call that shot? Gog, the leader. Still, though, as a supplier, remember, given weapons, given intel, at some point in time, something's going to go a little off. He's not going to want to get involved. You watch and see. How do you know? I don't know. I'm reading my Bible. The Bible tells us that Whoever the leader is, look, Putin could die tonight. Could be the next guy. We don't know. But it's going to be a person. Gog is a military political leader. A despot. We would say a despot. In Old English, we would say despot. Uh, uh, anyway, Russia, to back Iran's right to retaliate against Israel. That's one nation saying, you can go attack that other nation. That's how world wars begin, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, slide number nine, guys. Russia weapons help Iran harden defenses against Israeli airstrike. This is a big deal. Russia's got some really good stuff. They really do. Uh, he said, how do you know? Because they steal everything we, we invent. <laughs> it's famous. If MIT, Stanford, Lawrence Livermore uh, invent something, Russia's got it in two years. Same with China. Number eight, guys. Much the same. After attacking Israel, Iran counts on Russia's support moving forward. I would just say tonight that we are at the very least stage setting on the world scene for the Ezekiel battle to come. Or, and or, we are in a world war that is now beginning to escalate. Uh, more on that at the end. And I will, I will end this. We're going we're gonna to end with this new stuff here that I'm doing. Number six, guys. This is really amazing. Do you remember I mentioned to you... Um, Sheba and Dedan, Sheba and Dedan, remember that? You want to know, listen, in the Ezekiel battle of nations, don't ever confuse Ezekiel battle with Armageddon. Can't even, doesn't even come close. This is ridiculous. Armageddon are the nations of the world warring against themselves, the West and the, and the East, but the East is led by Antichrist, and the West is led by nations that don't submit to the Antichrist, and they meet in the valley of Har, H-A-R, Armageddon. Ezekiel's not that. But watch. Slide six says, a new Middle East. Arab nations openly join Israel in thwarting Iranian missile assault. Number 10. This guy's an interesting guy, but I actually enjoy him. Um, and he's wearing all the stuff. I would just want you to know that he's wearing the stuff because that's tradition. Don't think for a moment he's a believer in, uh, in, in religion. This is the, the prince of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia publicly acknowledges defending Israel from Iranian attacks, the report says. That turns out to be an absolute fact. 
I never thought I would ever be alive to say what I just said to you on a news report. That Saudi Arabia has signed up to protect Israel. You want to know why that's significant? Listen, the nations listed that attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, Lebanon's not mentioned. Syria's not mentioned. I don't think Syria's going to be in existence. That's my personal opinion. Something's going to happen. Jordan is not listed because we know from Scripture Jordan's going to be a friend of Israel. Did you know that? The Bible says so in the last days. And one other country in the region, Saudi Arabia, the Bible says they don't get involved. I never thought they would help. I just didn't think they'd get, they wouldn't get involved. This is amazing. This guy just pitted himself against the global jihadists. That is a major situation. Wow. Number 12, guys. The latest, Iran president warns of massive response if Israel launches tiniest invasion. We mentioned that earlier. Different news source. Number 11. The enemies of the West are preparing to use a tactical nuke. Well, who would that be? The enemies of the West are preparing to use a tactical nuke. Who would use a nuke? Iran would never have a nuke. They wouldn't have the money to develop. Oh, wait a minute. Number three. Ex-Mossad chief says hitting Iran's nuclear facility facilities on the table. That's kind of a given. Um, that's kind of a given. Israel, Israel is not big on taking out bodies. Have you noticed, you, whatever criticism you hear, you should just kind of study the facts in Israel's history. You guys, I'm telling you tonight, Israel has the technology right now to vaporize countries. Do you understand that? They've got the power to do that. They don't even, listen, they don't even have to use a nuclear bomb. Israel has developed laser technology that if they just went like this with, that, with the laser, just like that, as long as it took me to do that. See this? There'd be over 2,000 people dead in this room tonight. Like that. Did you know when Israel wants to disperse crowds, hostile crowds, do they, do they mow them down with machine guns? No. A Humvee pulls up with a little dome on it. And there's a guy sitting in there, probably some nerd guy from his, the science class at school. And he presses a button and a frequency goes out from that Humvee. And people run as fast as they can away from it. It causes extreme uh, ear vibration and headaches. And if they run away, their headache goes away. That's pretty merciful, don't you think? Yes. So they don't even have to use a nuke. They could use other things they have. Number 16, we're almost done. Netanyahu, despite allies' advice, that's putting it nicely, Israel will make our own decisions on security. Yep. Remarkably, we've, we've made it. Final one, and it's, it's like I'm ending here. What's behind that one? A whole nother few hours is behind this one. <laughs> Number 13 to end tonight. While everyone's looking in the Middle East, North Korea and China are stirring it up in the South China Sea, in the Sea of Japan. In that region, Philippines plans amphibious exercise with the U.S. as concerns over China grow. That is an understatement, friends. You need to start following uh, news on YouTube. Go to your YouTube and look for news. And what's good about it is you can watch what's happening. You can watch it. You, click, you see something of interest, click on watch it. 
And you'll see what's going on right now with Chinese uh, attack ships going up against Filipino ships, going up against Japanese ships, going up against other nations in the region. China's stirring it up. Listen, Kim Jong-un has not only been stirring it up, it turns out this week we have evidence confirming that Iran didn't have to get the money from Obama after all. They didn't have to buy centrifuges to get their plutonium and to get all of their... Turns out that Kim Jong-un has been supplying that stuff to Iran in their trade agreement. Hey, uh, we need uh, we need 50 million tons of bananas. <laughs> okay. Did you know that? You know North Korea has the atomic bomb, you know that? Yes. Can you imagine? You know who I'm talking about? Kim Jong-un. He has a bomb. They've been prolific. I just took you. I don't know. I'm six, ten thousand miles from one theater that is engaged in war to another theater that is on the brink of war. Japan is scrambling to figure out how it's going to defend itself because we, after World War II, told Japan, you cannot be a military anymore because you guys are crazy. <laughs> no more attacking the world. You have to sit still. We'll protect you. We will we'll pay to rebuild Japan, but you guys, you, guys, you, can't, you can't have anything big enough to protect yourself because you guys will go attack the world. So we'll take care of you. We'll be your protector. And Japan went, okay, fine. And now America goes down the hole, and Japan's like, oh, boy. <laughs> Philippines, yikes. Singapore, the whole region has been abandoned by American weakness. What does this mean? Weakness, guys, oh, every guy knows this. You, you can stand. You can stand. Every guy knows this. Weakness breeds... Violence. I guess none of these guys know this. <laughs> we, weakness breeds violence. Every guy knows this. You are not going to walk up to some guy with 21-inch biceps and punch him in the nose unless you want to commit suicide. <laughs> Even perceived strength is a deterrent. You're not going to want to hear this in closing, but... A, friend of mine who's a captain in Delta Airlines. I go, what's with the shoes? Why some airports shoes off shoe? He goes, well, you know, some airports have more, better technology. TSA has better airport security technology. That's why some airports, you don't have to take your computer out of your laptop. You just send it, I mean, your, um, your laptop out of your bag. You just send it all through because they got better technology. But I said, really, the shoes, though? I mean... And he goes, well, the shoes. He goes, that all came about from Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. Remember him? Yes. And he said, that's actually more for you than it is for anybody else. I go, what do you mean? And he said, that's, that is more perception to make you feel safer. But it doesn't, it's not going to do anything. But you feel better about it. So... Yesterday, yesterday morning, no, no, yet, yesterday afternoon, what did I do? Um, I went, I forget. <laughs> I went from Knoxville, no, Knoxville, ten, Tennessee, to Dallas, and I always tell Robin, Robin, whatever you do, never, never, this has been the rule for 25, almost 30 years, Robin, never have me have a connection in Dallas. Because you could have, you could say, well, I'll have a connection in Dallas because I know it's huge and crazy and the weather is so unpredictable, but I'll give myself a five-hour layover. 
You can do that. I've done that. And 10 minutes before you board your five-hour layover plane, a lightning strike hits the plane or it starts flooding. It is as though it's crazy. So we get in the plane. We're all sitting down. We're all ready to go. Dallas to, to home. And uh, the pilot goes, our navigation system's not... <laughs> it's not operating properly, everybody, so we're going to get the mechanics out here. So you know... If you're a flyer, it's like, <laughs> normally this means hour to five hours. So I'm getting ready to get off. So about 45 minutes later, he says, we've got the navigation system going. It's like, all right. <laughs> but it's Dallas. Because <laughs> you don't know if you're leaving Dallas until you've left. <laughs> All right, we're pushing back. Um, plane stops. No, no, keep going back. Keep going back. Mm. And then you know the thing. <laughs> yeah, this is Captain. Uh, and when they go like this, this is Captain. Uh, and he pauses. It seems like we are not getting the thrust out of our left engine that we... So we're going to go back to the gate. If you could see the seat that I was in, I was stuck in this seat, and next to me was a 270-pound um, cowboy. <laughs> that guy was 6'2", 270, and you could, you, could, you could put your hands around his waist. The guy was like the Hulk. His shoulders over the seat. I'm like over here. I took a picture. I took a video of it. I said, you don't, you don't mind, do you? This is amazing. I have to show my wife this. And I went like this. Here's the thing. The pilot had made a cool comment. We, have, we can't leave without a navigational system. He said, I know how to get to Ontario. I could, it's a clear day. I can fly you there. But we can't do it because we don't have the systems operational that makes it all legal. Things aren't, things aren't in line. Friends, things are in line regarding God's operations. Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Jesus of this book that you've been reading about tonight, Jesus Christ is God the Son who came to this earth, the Bible says, to die for your sins and mine. It's the same prophecy promise keeper who died on the cross and rose again from the dead that if you put your faith in him, and there's no reason why you shouldn't, he's given you Bible prophecy to show you how trustworthy he is. You trust Jesus today, my friends. Don't trust anybody around you. Not, I mean, don't be cynical about it, but it's like, trust, <laughs> trust Christ. He'll never let you down. He's the God that fulfills all prophecy. And the greatest prophecy of all is that he loves you and he wants you to accept him and walk with him. Think about that, walking with him from here on out. Wherever you walk, he's with you. Whatever you do, he's with you. Wherever you go, he's with you. Rejoice in that. Father, we thank you so much and praise you, God, for your word. Fulfill it all as you will. And in our lifetime, Lord, may we not miss one move or one stroke of your brush. In Jesus' name, we worship you in closing. Amen.